I, I, I need to know this for my own personal edification, but who here is a, a gamer? Who are the MMO players who's like totally addicted to Warcraft or played EverQuest for 27 hours a day, whatever else it was? Yeah, okay, good. There's plenty of hands up in the air. I'm, uh, I, I'm, I've been doing this for way too long. <laughs> so at one point, uh, I was convinced that Meridian 59 was the first graphical MMO. Uh, I was convinced of the error of my ways uh, long ago, but I never had heard of Habitat until these guys decided they were going to do their talk. So um, my addiction actually goes back further than I thought it did. And um, with that, I'd like to get you guys going because you have the fun stuff to talk about. Are you ready? Ready as we'll ever be. All right. So I'm as anxious as you are to find out about Habitat. Let's let them go. Thanks, guys. You're going to stand? Well, I'd stand now. Okay. I'm Chip Morningstar. I'm Randy Farmer. We are going to talk today about how Lucasfilm's habitat changed everything. Um, so I want to set a little framing, um, which has changed since I wrote this talk yesterday, uh, my part of my talk. Um, I thought this was an audacious t title when I titled it. Um, I walked into the museum today and saw a sign downstairs that said, write software, change everything, or change the world. Uh, so I feel like this fits in perfectly. Um, but the point I wanted to make before I start is there are people all through here, and there's technology represented all through here that changed everything. This is just our attempt to carry one thread from the 1980s through to the present. And so how you can see one set of technological innovations, one set of social innovations, one set of legal innovations um, had an effect on the industry in ways you might have been surprised by. And I believe all the technologies here have had some kind of thread like this. Uh, not everyone gets to close its loop. We're going to talk about closing the loop today. Uh, but I wanted to share that before we started, that this is an acknowledgement of all the contributions by all the people here who have changed everything as well. Um, so I'm going to start my part of the top, first part of the talk in the vintage era. This is uh, meant to cover the years roughly from 1985 to 1994, which is the era of habitat. Now, what was Lucasfilm's habitat? I have something to share with you, which is an eight-minute video, which was made promoting Lucasfilm's Habitat when it first came out. And oh, I want to share one thing. There's a reason this video takes eight minutes instead of 30 seconds like it would today. It's because most of the things in this video are brand new. In 1986, when we were working on this with a company called Quantum Link, um, they couldn't describe, they said they couldn't describe Habitat in 25 words or less. And, and my project logo says this is the first MMO the first virtual world. Those expressions did not exist. They did not have meaning. If I had used them, they would have been vapor. So somewhere along the way, we went from no one knows what the hell this is to these are industries. So that's why this might take a little bit. Let's try to put yourself in the mindset of 1986 when this is uh, shown at a nightclub in New York um, for the first time. Go ahead. Yeah, the premiere of Habitat was at the Palladium in New York City in 1986, and Quantum Link was really struggling with how to communicate what the hell this was, because it was just nothing that fit any of the existing categories. Um, we were very fortunate that uh, the general manager of Lucasfilm Games, Steve Arnold, uh, was married to a very talented video producer. And, uh, and he said to her, can you solve this problem? And this is what came. Yeah, 
me see that. Five cents, Pops. The name's not Pops. I just want to find out about this here parallel world. Uh, it's called Habitat, but cough up that dope, Pops. No playing games. Jimmy, the name's not Pops. Look, I promise I'll pay you as sure as my name is. Valentino. Valentino? What's going on here? What kind of game are you playing, Pops? Pops and his friend Jimmy aren't the first people to get drawn into this strange new world where names can change as quickly as events. Surprises lurk at every turn, and the keynotes of existence are fantasy and fun here in a place called Habitat. What do you teleport to? <coughs> where am I? And who in the heck are you? It is said that boredom once ruled the lifestyles of the avatars, the beings who populate this world. But recently, all that changed. With the birth of an alliance between powerful beings, both here in Habitat and in the human realm. And with the cooperation of a huge mainframe computer in Virginia. Now using their modems and Commodore computers, people from Westport to Walla Walla can join Quantum Link and Lucasfilm on an electronic journey unlike any other. Well, that leads to Habitat, where thousands of avatars, each controlled by a different human, can converge to shape an imaginary society. Hey, listen, my real name's Henry. Uh, they call me Pops. I, I mean... No, sick wit. Henry's your human. He's just controlling you. Here you get to be someone else. Well, th th then I, I guess I really am Valentino. Talk about great expectations, lover boy. Now let me be a minute. I got some digging to do and some treasure to find. It is a place full of drama and adventure. A place where a thousand and one things can happen simultaneously. Making the possibilities here positively unpredictable. So, rest assured, our Mr. Valentino will hardly be alone. Hot dog! A hole! For example, Sweldrella here is an avatar controlled by Luann Smith from Beverly Hills. Here on a quest for high magic. And high magic is just what she's found. Here in a land that lies beyond her wildest dreams. A crystal ball! Oh, maybe it will take me away from this dull tropical paradise. What I want is adventure. <coughs> yeah, and, and what about me? Ask the Oracle. Sooner or later, he'll answer. I promise. Like many avatars, Sweldrella lives for adventure. And it's the great Oracle, Habitat's resident source of wisdom and wizardry, who often do the visit. And although this crystal ball is just one of the magical vehicles of the Oracle, it may be precisely the ticket she's looking for. Now stand aside, Valentino. I'm bound for adventure. Uh-oh. But powerful as it is, the Oracle is only one source of action here in Habitat. Surprise! Because Sweldrella knows that it also depends on who she happens to meet, and then how she exercises her own power to shape her destiny. Hi! Wanna hit the hot tub back at my toy? Zap, birdie. This is one of Habitat's newest recruits, an avatar named Young Turk. Back in Poughkeepsie, he's Conrad Klein, a lawyer with Klein, Cates, Kipling, and Klein. And right now, he is choosing a new look that will reflect his real self-image from toe to head. Obviously anxious to show off his true self. And to get on with his first excursion, Conrad Klein directs his alter ego avatar out into the meandering, unpredictable world of Habitat, where each and every environment connects to another. With nearly a thousand and one different places to explore, from forests, caves, deserts, and tropical paradise, to Papalopolis, the thriving metropolis. But want to buy this key? Unlocks the secrets to the universe, it does. Fast action may be the name of the game for much of the fringe element in Habitat society, but young Turk is after a different kind of action. His aim is to become one of Habitat's social paraparazzi and to do some plain, old-fashioned networking. In fact, many an avatar will congregate simply to compare notes about the human realm, to keep up on Habitat current events, and to 
socialize. Say, I know. You're that guy Lamborghini from Detroit, aren't you? Oh, the name's Young Turk from Poughkeepsie. I like that better. Let's blow this joint. What do you say? Oh, took the words right out of my mouth. Habitat. It is a universe unlike any other, full of fantasy and the unexpected. Because you never know who you might actually wind up meeting in reality. Take Thornton, for example. In the real world, he's a columnist for the town crier in the seaside village of Nag's Head. Here, he runs the Habitat Gazette. Or Chelsea Sweetwater, who's run out of funds to redecorate her Boston mansion. In Habitat, she can change her turf as often as some folks change their radio station. Then there is P.T. Warbucks, a merciless shopaholic. Like every avatar, he's endowed with a trust fund. He fritters away his days with drawing cash tokens from his auto teller and spending it lavishly on trinkets in the vendor machine. Or Bob Beasley, who is the enterprising type. He has moved to Habitat to open a trivia shop, where he sells it by the pound. And, of course, Valentino who's now found his calling communicating through the Habitat mail. In fact, there's more to see and do in the world of Habitat than any avatar or human could possibly imagine. Socializing, games playing, adventuring, shopping, selling, and sometimes there's just no telling. Funny, this doesn't look like Kansas. Uh, I mean, Habitat. Because each time a visitor re-enters Habitat, Things might be just a little bit different. We're in a world based on the motto that behind every avatar there is an enterprising human who can expect nothing but surprises. It's a place that will be shaped by the interactions of thousands of avatars, a place that constantly evolves. Even the mysterious Argo will play his part as he creates new regions for questing. It all adds up to a whole new kind of entity. Intriguing world that's just plain difficult to leave. Lucasfilm's Habitat. It's a wonderful new place that's simply out of this world. Coming to life only on Quantum Link. There you go. Oh, thank you for rebalancing. I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, noted the, co the copyright date, 1986. This would enter more into the story in the future. Um, did you want to say something? No. Um, so, Habitat was the first of its kind, like I said, and it took eight minutes to explain, uh, what, and, uh, what we now call, we would now call a, um, sandbox game, uh, MMO, RPG, it had combat. I forgot to put that on this list. This is a list of Habitat Day One innovations. Most of these were demonstrated in the video you saw. Um, I'm not going to read them all on the list. I'm gonna call out a couple that ended up having profound effects. Uh, but I've been told by people who've watched Habitat video, by the way, if you ever wanna see that yourself, it's on YouTube. Just look for Lucasfilm's Habitat. Promotional video will come right up. Um, but besides having this big sandbox play, which was so different. Um, just so you know, this is the first use ever recorded of the use of the word avatar, meaning your, your embodied character in a multi-user game. Um, and Chip Morningstar is responsible for that coining. Um, you may not have noticed there, but you may notice if you play the game, we have ghosts. We have an observer-only mode. This is a way to deal with traffic jam problems, because one of the things you probably didn't realize is that game ran at 300 baud. That's 30 characters per second. That's some people can type faster than the net was, especially if you count for having to retransmit because it was a really lousy network. Um, we have this long list of things. I'm, like I said, I'm not going to read them all, but the things that have carried forward and been interesting uh, include uh, virtual currency. The first online virtual currency was scarce objects with vending machines. You saw that. Um, and uh, one thing I wanted to call out on the technical side, besides these various long uh, firsts, well, there's a lot of firsts in there because we didn't know what it was going to be, so you just threw everything in. It was like kitchen sink. 
Um, but some people, when they see the video, go, gosh, I wish my MMO had player housing. It's like, the first one had it. Um, well, the thing I want to call out that's interesting is the end-to-end object-oriented design. Um, everything about it was done object-oriented in 1986, even though the environment didn't support object-oriented programming on either side. These are both procedural languages, 6502 on one side, and PL1 on the other side. Uh, and we're going to talk more about the effect that chip having a strict object-oriented model in his implementation had on the future. Oh, uh, I forgot to mention the most important thing. Uh, in 1990, we wrote a paper called The Lessons of Lucasfilm Habitat. If you haven't read it, it's a fun read. Um, it was famous because of all the things we said we did wrong. We built this first one, and we said, oh, here's a bunch of stuff you probably shouldn't do again. And it took a long time for the other guys to learn not to do those things, uh, and it's cited in hundreds of texts. I want to go through the history now, this 1986 through 1994 thing. So I just showed you a video of Lucasfilm's Habitat. In fact, that only deployed during its open beta period from 1986 to 19, late 1987, early 1988. And it, at the project at the end, when we're going to talk about Neo Habitat, that's the world that's been redeployed. Um, it's the one I ran. I was the Oracle. I was responsible for the bulk of the client coding and responsible for much of the world implementation uh, and design. Chip was responsible for the server, the overarching design, the pitch. He brought me onto the project um, long after he had started pitching it to, uh, to Quantum Link. Um, and of course, we were backed up by Lucasfilm Games, which had some of the greatest engineering team underneath that were driving the edge of everything. First thing I did for Lucasfilm was a real-time fractal first-person shooter called Coronas Rift on the Apple II. So these guys were really driving the edge. And do you want to say something about any of that? OK. Um, but like I said, Quantum Link couldn't figure out what to do with it. They couldn't describe it in 25 words or less. They shut it down. Then they brought it back. They went, you know, we spent a lot of money on this and a lot of time. It took three years to build, which is insane. Paying three, for three years of development in the 1980s is just nuts could only happen at Lucasfilm, only with the backing of great people like Steve Arnold and George Lucas. And they eventually went, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to throw away your world. We're going to keep the client the same. I no longer worked at the company. They had, let's, let's ask Randy to replace the screen with a new product. And they rebranded the product and shipped it in 1988 under the name Quantum Link's Club Carib. I call this club metaphor because what they were doing is they were trying to say, I want to make this something I can understand. So they said, well, you know, we can make like, they had some islands and some stuff. We'll put that up. We'll use only the human heads. You probably saw some monster heads and other pig faces. They took all that out because they didn't have to take it out of the client. Well, that's what was interesting. It was on the server. It's object oriented on the server. You tell, every object says, what kind am I? What graphics should I use? What sounds should I use? And they just used a small subset, which was all humans all running around and playing on a beach. So they described it as chat on the beach. Well, they, they rebranded it with this sort of club med resort metaphor. And one of the things they did was they took out all of the fantasy elements, all of the science fictional elements, anything that seemed out of the ordinary, because they were afraid that their customer base wouldn't understand those things. Um, not thinking for a moment that they had gone out of the way to hire Lucasfilm, Lucasfilm, the producers of Star Wars, to create this. So um, what, what you see here is the region they would build, which was the new user region. So that would invite people in. And you can see the beginnings of some of those fantasy elements returning. So during the lifetime from 1988 to 1994, they gradually upgraded the product by literally just adding new object instances to the server and never updating the software. And again, this one point only O mentality would have a reflection in the future. Yeah, all, all, the, all the, the, the elements that they'd taken out out of fear found their way back in probably within the first six months. Yeah, by 19... Largely driven by audience demand. Yeah, by 1990, well, so a lot of their audience were people who had been in the beta test and they said, I want to jump around as a maniac, man, man, um, a maniac mansion tentacle. We had a tentacle body. Uh, we had a helicopter body. We had all these different things. We were experiments. Like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of a kitchen soup kind of thing. Uh, and so they were able to turn those on incrementally over the lifetime, over the, what is that, six-year lifetime of the product. Um, 
Just as Krub Cree was shipping, Fujitsu became very interested in Habitat. They had this new machine coming out called the FM Towns computer. They were looking for a landmark, a killer app, as they used to call those in those days. And uh, they were very interested in Habitat. Chip and I consulted with them to produce Lucasfilm's Habitat. And so in the late 1980s, early 1990s, Japan took over the lead in this branch of virtual worlds called Lucasfilm's Habitat. Um, a few years would pass. Fujitsu, Habit, I mean, uh, 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 Worlds Away would shut down. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Club Creed would shut down. Now Fujitsu had the only real working servers up. They became interested in a new version. So they said, I want to bring it back to the United States. They hired Chip and I to help them figure out how to put together a proposal to buy the rights. So Fujitsu bought the intellectual property rights for Lucasfilm's Habitat from Lucasfilm, and then funded an effort to bring it back to the United States under a new thing. This is a Commodore, uh, this is a independent platform, independent virtual world platform called uh, Worlds Away, which we originally shipped on the CompuServe network was the backbone network. And, and eventually backbone networks would go away as we know. This is the end of the per minute ch charging, which was before and now the per month charging. Um, so Worlds Away was built from the beginning as a second system, so it's got all the improvements I ever wanted to put in. Um, and it was built to be internationalized from the beginning, because now we knew we were going to take it back to Japan. There, there's another detail that figures into the story, which is they hired us to manage this project, and we weren't that interested in, because like we've been there, we've done that. We have this other thing we're more interested in that you might have some interest in in the future, and so what they actually did is they hired us to manage this project part-time and spend the rest of our time on advanced planning for the new future amazing thing, whatever that was going to be. Right. And they'd get a right of first refusal. And that ends up figuring into the later part of the story. Yes, yeah, so as, as things go on, you start to become interested in more than just one thing. Uh, and we were interested, in, in fact, in a much bigger network that was not just about um, uh, you know, sandbox play. Um, so, of course... Worlds Away finally works its way back to Japan. It's now Habitat 2 there. That's what it's branded at. There's a wedding there. You can see that it's different. But what happens now is happening to lots of other products. We're now beginning to see a fork of these things. They're now becoming platforms. So instead of a game, it's a platform. And this platform spreads um, to Korea uh, and other locations, multiple services. So some Korean ones on the right. Um, that's Sanrio World, AKA. Hello Kitty World. So they, sometimes they fraction by content, sometimes they fraction by environment, uh, and even Worlds Away itself fractioned into multiple services and servers. Um, so there's a sense of uh, platformization which starts to occur. And this figures into as things go forward. Um, that plan that Chip was talking about led to one more virtual world that Chip and I worked on together. That plan that Fujitsu funded but opted out of is this thing that eventually shipped into the name EC Habitats. And I'm going to let Chip talk about some of the technology that was developed there. But it's paradigm shifting. We're starting to move away from just the idea of a server charging time or some other things for access to clients to, to just have a social activity. Um, uh, so this is uh, 3D and multi-camera view, lots of interesting research. One of the things we also found out is uh, we continue to pioneer. This contains things that would not be deployed commercially for other applications for 20 years. Well, one of the things that happened is we'd done this study for Fujitsu, and then we were approached by some venture capitalists who said, hey, we want to do a, a Hollywood meets Silicon Valley thing. And we said, no, 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 here's this thing that we've done. And they said, oh, that's cool. Here's some money. Uh, the two big things that we were interested in were we'd like to make the world distributed, meaning not just that it's on bunches of computers, but you over there, you can run your part of the world, and you over there, you can run your part of the world, and that company over there can run their part of the world, and it's all connected. Uh, and then the other was to make it user extensible, so I could create new kinds of objects and introduce them to the environment and actually have them work, and I could take the thing that I created in one place, take it into some other place run by somebody else and still continue to have it to work. And that ended up 
unfolding into an, a host of really challenging technical problems. And in fact, I'm going to punt the lead of this discussion to Chip about the evolution and influence of these products on everyday computing. Sure. So that there's a, there's a technical legacy which there's kind of two threads to this, or, or, or maybe a lot more than two threads to this. But we had, you know, we had a project which spawned another project, which spawned a company, which spawned another company, which spawned another company. And all of this time, we're kind of building on the same, the same technical thread, the same, same set of foundations. So over the course of the years, we ended up creating, I don't know, how many different generations of uh, uh, multi-user server uh, platforms, but they're all based on fundamentally the same architecture that goes back to 1986, and in fact, the most yeah. that, that object version. model I talked about has been yeah. ported and, nine and, times. And a, 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 a model for distributed object computation, which is a little obscure, but which is, in fact, incredibly powerful, and which we've been able to leverage in all kinds of ways. And so, uh, we, so you, you set this, this chain of events in motion, which leads to all kinds of stuff. So we have um, uh, what started out as a, a multiplayer video game back in 1986, unpacks by the time we're in, you know, 2000, 2001 into a company that's doing um, uh, uh, multi-user commercial application server, um, but based on the same fundamental uh, architecture, and which ends up folding in all kinds of stuff that was developed earlier. So one of the things we did, uh, Electric Communities, which is the company that, that Randy and I and, and Douglas Crockford, another one of our longtime partners in crime and former Lucasfilm alum, uh, which was to do this all singing, all dancing, fully extensible, fully decentralized, multi-user virtual world. Um, uh, one of the things that came out of that was a programming language called E, which is probably the most influential programming language that you've never heard of. Um, but E turns out to feed uh, directly into a lot of this stuff which is happening today with JavaScript. So uh, this notion of promise-based asynchronous computation, which has its roots in uh, some work that was done at uh, Project Xanadu, but which we picked up and ran with at Electric Communities, and Mark Miller, who was the architect of E, uh, ended up getting looped into uh, the JavaScript community, as did Doug Crockford, who's quite, quite well known in that community. And so now all of this stuff is starting to find its way out in the world. We did... Um, State Software is the next A thing. company called State Software, which Doug and I founded, and then Randy ended up working for uh, around the turn of the millennium. Um, where we were basically taking the server system that we built at Electric Communities, but which had collapsed into a lawyer's file cabinet somewhere in corporate bankruptcy, in which we had no access to, so we had to re-implement it. Um, but we knew all of the cool stuff and how all the cool stuff had to work, and we ended up um, inventing things like uh, what is now known as JSON, which is a data standard which is taking over the world, um, mostly created because we hated XML. Yeah, so everyone, um, we were doing what would now be called web applications, trying to get interactive stuff going on 4.0 yeah. browsers. And we, I remember I was sitting at my desk going, please tell me I don't have to do any more of this binary encoding like we used to do. Why can't we just send JavaScript? And these guys would take it and go, well, let's just send the JavaScript objects. And then Doug Crocker would say, hey, I can fit that description on a page. And the next thing you know, uh, we end up with a server, which is the first JSON server, right. and I would write a prototype for Node.js by taking SpiderMonk, that's what we call it now, but I took SpiderMonk, and added Philo and Com, and there you go. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, one of the things that happens is we'd, we'd done this thing, and I named it uh, JSON because it was JavaScript object notation, and you could pronounce it like it was somebody's name, um, and Doug runs off and registers the domain name json.org and puts a one-page description up, and we started pretending as if it was a standard. And this is back when everybody wanted to use XML, and we'd say, oh, no, we're using JSON, and we'd point them at this web page. Um, and, you know, over a couple of years, people, other people started treating it as if it really was a standard, and now it really is a standard. In fact, I'm the, I'm the editor of the ECMA 404 ISO JSON standard, and it's just because, you know, 
We're, we were fake it till you make it. Easiest job you ever had. Yeah, yeah. My job at, at, at editing the JSON standard is really easy because my main, main, main mission is to make sure nobody ever changes it. Um, there's also a legal legacy that unfolds from this because we did Habitat at a time just before it became possible to, to, to get software patents. As a result of which, all of that work, and some other work we did at the time, but mostly Habitat, is a gold mine of prior art. And so all of this crazy stuff that people went and patented that they should never have been able to patent, we've now been able to use Habitat as the definitive invalidating prior art to say, no, 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 this has been done before. And crazy things that people would try to patent, like uh, word balloons in, in, in speech, in an online chat, or uh, online gambling or, or online virtual goods. It's like, those are obvious things, but we had them in 1986, and so uh, people who tried to patent them in 2003 were out of luck. And so we kind of lost track of how much stupid software patents we've managed to help defeat as a result of just having all of this stuff in our back pockets um, and rescuing lots of people from patent trolls, You're which tell I'm very the proud, proud of. And also, during, during lean times, we've been able to... Uh, pay the rent by uh, consulting to law firms and being able to charge the extra special rate that you get so, to charge lawyers. So, so you want to know how nuts patents got? So as you'll recall in my part of the story, I talked about how we had made Lucasfilm's Habitat, Jap uh, Fujitsu licensed it in the 80s, brought out a version in the late 80s, early 90s, then brought out Worlds Away uh, and had us work on that for them in 1996. So here's what happens. They file for a patent for the virtual world in 1996 because that's when the craze hits. Chip and I have to get a lawyer to tell them, no, they can't patent it, because they put our names on them. Actually, put his name on wrong. And tell them, no, you can't patent this. Here's why. And I supply all the 1988 documentation of Lucasfilm's Habitat. We think it goes away. Six years later, I find out they granted the patent. According to the patent office, I am the holder of the patent for the virtual world, which is silly. I told you it was Chip's idea. But, um, but it's, it's a silly patent. So we, we actually have our active, uh, if they were trolls were still going, we would be actively against this patent if Fujitsu ever tried to use it. Now, the truth is, they were just trying to get in that race where they could say they had patents like everybody else was. They don't, they don't give a darn anyway. But um, that's how crazy that stuff got. Um, so it's oddly, here's a cool trick, because it's a patent, it's prior art on any patent after it, even if it's an invalid patent. That's how that works. And so we go forward in time, and in 2014 or 2015, was it, Alex? Um, uh, there was a, an event at the Game Developers Conference, which was a Lucasfilm Games LucasArts uh, post-mortem retrospective session that I was invited to speak at. And a couple of weeks before that, I get an email from this guy, Alex Handy, at the Museum of Arts and Digital Entertainment in Oakland saying, hey, I've got this, this museum, and we're doing this thing, and you're... We're going to do an exhibit in, in conjunction with the, the Lucasfilm postmortem, and um, you know we wondered if you had any stuff that you're willing to share with the community to show off. And so I sent him an archive of all the source code from Habitat, and he got very for excited patents. and said, "For patent enforcement only." Sir? For patent enforcement only. Yeah, for patent enforcement. That's why I had it. Yeah, yeah, that's the reason. And um, he says, "Oh well, let's let's start a project to see if we can." so we can get it working again. Do you think we can do that before GDC? And I said, uh, no, uh, but it's a, it's a fun idea. And that started the ball rolling, and we started accumulating a, a, a growing horde of volunteers and supporters. Um, we got somebody from Stratus, who was the, the maker of the original mini computers that Quantum Link ran Habitat on, to donate a computer, and they got it working, and we had this whole idea that we'd just use all the original technology. Um, and we had a hackathon at the, at the museum to try to get everything working all at once, and um, you know, it, was, it was a fun event, but, but you know, we got about this far, which is actually pretty significant. This is um, sort of the first stage loading a screen with the avatar, no head, but just, just the body standing in an empty room. Um, but there were pieces of the technology that we didn't have because we had all the Lucasfilm code, all the Habitat code, but what we didn't have was a bunch of Quantum Link sort of infrastructure stuff that was necessary to make it go, and we'd have to get that from 
Quantum Link, which was now uh, called America Online. Um, and so uh, there began a long process of trying to extract the, the relevant bits of code from AOL. And what ended up happening is they were amenable in principle. And we'd have lots of conversations that kind of went along the lines of, uh, can we get this stuff? And they'd say, sure, you can have the stuff. And a few, couple months would pass and say, can we have the stuff, please? And they say, sure, you can have the stuff. And after about a year of this, Randy gets really Two frustrated. Two years of this. Randy gets really frustrated and says, I don't want to do this. Um, and so we started to take yeah, an so alternate path. End of last year, I've had enough of this shit waiting for AOL. So we've got the source code. So here's what we got. We've got this inventory. What we've got is we've got Vice, the Commodore emulator. It's open source. It actually, it turns out, would run the Habitat client to the level, already that little 15-line server that you saw, the avatar with no head in the orange room. Um, I could run a server that did that. And I went, uh, and it would work. And in fact, that was Vice running it. That screenshot is a Vice screenshot. It's not a real Commodore 64, because I didn't want to have to deal with disks and all that other stuff. I went, this thing can actually do this. That's amazing. And well, we've been talking about, and the Q-Link Reloaded, uh, uh, Steve, who's on the project, had this branch of this abandonware uh, Q-Link substitute, which was written in Java. And it knew the protocol. That was the most important part. It actually knew how to speak the binary protocol uh, that the client needed to speak. And all right, so we got that. And uh, Elko is the public domain, or I mean, the, the open source version of the same JSON server, the direct descendant of the first JSON server that Chip wrote over and over. I don't know how many times, but it's called Elko 2 here because it got well, released there, twice. There, there, yeah, there's a history there, which is which was we'd done this cool server at Electric Communities that was based on the palace. And then we lost that when the Electric Communities went under. So we had to go re-implement it at State Software. And we re-implemented it in Java, and it was very cool. And then that company was a long story there. but. Uh, that ended up collapsing into another lawyer's file cabinet. And then I went to Yahoo, and Doug Crockford and I, who were both at Yahoo at the time, as was Randy, um, had a project that we really wanted that stuff for. And I had the old documentation, so I re-implemented again. And, um, and, and it worked great, and then I ended up leaving Yahoo, but they let me have it. And after having gone through a couple iterations of, you know, collapsing behind a legal barrier of some kind, I now own this thing free and clear. So immediately slapped it on the web. It's like, OK, here's the source. It's out there. MIT license. It's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. Yeah. And now we have it. Now, it's now it's free best forever. Best multi-user server you've never known about. And it's the second generation. So I knew that's available. And I've been frustrated for two years because the stuff AOL did, other than the protocol, which I was going to get out of the Q-Link Reloaded, was services like, you know, read databases into objects and, and create virtual rooms. A couple of basic services is all we needed. So Elko did all of those things because Chip and I have rewritten multi-user room-based systems for 30 years. So I'm going to use that baby. That's in Java. We're going to port it in Java. So, um, and sure enough, the, oh, these are all the URLs for all these open source things. Um, Alex took Chip's code now, which was legally open source because he got Fujitsu to give them the rights to do so, which is the game, be game part. I'm just going to port that in Java. I'll show you the code in a second. Uh, and JavaScript. So I'm going to use Java on the back end and JavaScript to do the protocol translation. And there's some semantic translations, too. It's going to go from binary to JSON. So now the Habitat server is a JSON server written by the guys who invented JSON and perfected the JSON servers. And um, there's a, a translation layer so it can talk to the original client, but it's not limited to that client. So the first thing I started writing was JSON bots and Node.js to test the darn thing. So before you know it, avatars are running around in the test servers all the time. So that equals the neoclassical server, uh, server project known as neohabitat.org. Um, yeah, well, not all of them are, but most of them are GitHub. They're easy to get. All this go, stuff is If you go GitHub. to neohabitat.org, you can get all of it. Uh, and here's the uh, project screen. It's got all the credit for all the people who helped, Fujitsu and the maid. Um, that's, we made a special launch screen, because the one thing we did do, because we didn't get anything from Qu Quantum Link or AOL, is we pretty much eliminated them from the login flow. So instead of going through Quantum Link and all the different steps you had to go through to get to the game, you can literally download a package now, double click, and get into the server. 
this is an example of the code. I'm, um, I'm sure you can't read it from back there. But this is the point I was making. One of the reasons I could go to, Al uh, to, to, to Alex and say, I want to port this. I think I can do it in a few months as an open source project was I knew what the architecture was. I knew the source code intimately. My name's all over it. And I knew that behaviors were written in chunks that look exactly like JSON methods. Because guess what? The guy who later would invent JSON wrote the original code. So his, the, his mental model has been in it through ever. So this is almost line for line if you look at this. Um, of course, the development environment, this is a text editor and raw text. That, of course, is an IDE and all the cool stuff you get for that. Uh, we launched an open source project uh, right around between January and February. It's officially announced in February, but some of us were on board a little earlier than that. And in June, uh, we had our big party out at the Maid where we went into beta, which is this is eternal beta. It's never going to ship because it doesn't have, that doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't have anyone running it. Um, I'm just the guy who says yes or no to the PRs, and that's it. Um, here it is, the first day that it actually runs native. So first that was on Vine, right? One of the cool things is now every developer is required to run their own server, run their own database, build their own world, and then they can test locally with their local wonderful IDEs uh, and the and emulators. But on June 2nd, we managed to get, uh, right before this, the com com um, development community kind of plugged in. This is a guy in Germany who got it working on June 2nd. This is the first day it's actually running on a Commodore 64. And it's, of course, connected to uh, people, some of those you'll see on the screen right now, um, from Germany, uh, United States, Britain. It turns out uh, open source is really cool. Uh, people work on it day or night or not or whatever. I mean, it's my first open source project. But it's possible and only possible because all of it is open source. There's no proprietary anything. You can grab your own server, you can fork, you, you, all the stuff that goes with that. But it's also part of where the energy come from. I wanted to share one thought about this team that surprised me and was really cool. Another thing you get is social effects. So very few of the people on this project ever used Lucasfilm's Habitat or Club Creep. To be frank, many of them aged out, right? Um, but the stars who come in, the people who have come in, are the people who use the systems after that. So, Many of the lead people, the most active people in our group, are those who played Worlds Away and its varied branches, um, who are either involved in the development or they've loved running it, um, and they, they're dedicating themselves to the preservation of the original. This also means, of course, that we do have a little bit of a fork inside. There's a, there's a special feature. There are some features marked with a special marker. That means it's a Neo Habitat feature. Um, so we have a switch to go original mode, or you can play with the slightly improved version. Um, and that's mostly the result of the people who worked on the later versions who really want some of those fixes ported back to the original. Um, but we're going to leave you with one last set of thoughts. So Post the we're up to present now. So yeah, so yeah one of the things that, that really struck me about this project was there's sort of th three habitats. There is the habitat that, that, that actually existed and there is a, a sort of historical reconstruction, historical archiving function in resurrecting that. And I think we've, we've done that. There's the, the habitat that everybody remembers, which is where people take the original experience and then they edit out all of the bad parts, like the fact that it takes a long time to go from one place to another and that response times are really terrible when you're at 300 baud. Um, and we're pretty close to delivering that experience. And then there's the, the habitat that could be, which is now we've kind of broken this thing down into its, into its constituent parts, and it's all open source. I, yeah, I just hit the button by mistake. And, um, and you know, it's dependent on the Commodore 64 client. The Commodore 64 client, by the way, is the original out-of-the-box code. I mean, you can just literally take the floppy disk image that was laying around in your closet from 30 years ago, if you happen to be one of the rare people who has that, plug it in and use it. It will work with our server today. Um, but all of the graphical assets, all of the sound assets, all of the, everything that goes into it, it's all out there. The Elko server uses a text mode protocol. Um, and I'm hoping that, that some 
somebody will come along and build us a web-based client for it. Nobody has yet. I don't know if anybody ever will. But there's this, this, this substrate, this set of materials that are there for the taking, for anybody who cares to be inspired. Um, and we have this awesome server platform, which is the, you know, I don't know, eighth or ninth generation descendant of the original, uh, uh, the original Habitat server, which is this thing which scales like mad and supports a whole class of multi-user applications, which are really a pain in the ass to do with the web stack. Um, and all of this stuff is on GitHub. It's free for the taking to anybody who wants to play with it. Um, and, and there's a guy who's really experienced in porting platforms to Elko standing right here, willing to help. So. And, you know, and we've been feeding a lot of these ideas into, in particular, into the JavaScript world. JavaScript, I think, has kind of ironically become our last best hope for reliable, secure computation, um, which at one level absolutely terrifies me and at another level amazes me. And I think, actually, we may be able to pull it off. I've gotten very involved with that uh, standards effort. But... We're in this situation now where there's a zillion cool things you could do, and yet there's this chain of historical continuity where the next generation of tinkerers and hackers and people who are just inspired by interesting problems now have this kind of rich reservoir of, of things to play with. So I have a long list of projects. Anybody out here need a project? Did I mention all of this stuff is on GitHub and you can get it for free? So with that, we're going to wrap. I wanted to share um, the current list of Neo Habitat contributors because what we're really talking about here is even though Chip and I are up here talking like heroes, this is all built on the backs of all the people who built all the technology up until us, the stuff we built, and the stuff we built and, with other people. And, and, and we started doing this thing, and all of these people come out of the woodwork. Some of them are folks from long ago that we hadn't seen in years, and some of uh. them are just kids who just, hey, I saw this cool thing. I want to get involved. Hi, so how can I help? Keith Elkin, um, who has actually, I'm afraid, has disappeared since the June 2nd launch, was the guy who kept the archive on the internet of all the photos and all the data he could get about Habitat when we stopped caring about it for 30 years. So he was the first guy. I, I, I was amazed when he showed up. I was so excited uh, because he was the one who helped us keep true. He had videotape of the original region so we could make sure we were making the right things. Um, uh, I already mentioned uh, Steve, and that Steve uh, has played a huge role. Um, but there's people on here like Gary Lake, who is the vice president of games for Warner Brothers. There's a bunch of executives. I, open source is amazing. You never knew who you're going to get. Um, and the talent has been amazing, but it's not the same as hiring people. They work on what they want to work on when they want to work on it. Um, but look at how quickly we get six months. We went from from not having a back end at all to up and running with what we've got. Yes, Alex. So he didn't put his name on the list, but we'll put it on there. Yeah. So this is uh, this document is also an open source document. Michael has not written on it. Um, anyway, we wanted to thank you. We have ten minutes to answer questions. Questions. You're you're most you're most welcome. You. Yeah. So sure. the, th the thing about Jason, no, that's yeah. fun. He thanked us for Jason, but but let me tell you, we crashed our company on Jason because we were trying to get people to use Jason. When uh, we have this problem, we have this problem of being visionaries. We said this is obviously the only way to send data like this. Uh, it's in the clear. It's light. It's easy to interpret. It's blah blah blah. All the reasons it's great. Uh, and they said, but it's not XML. And we literally, I spent engineering time wrapping Jason with XML in an attempt to try to land clients. It was the dumbest thing I've ever done. Okay. Other questions? Surely you have questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll walk in front of the screen this time. Uh, I was in a similar position um, as the person who introduced this by having the impression that Meridian 59 was the first MMO, and I had never heard of Habitat. So my question is, when, when this was being developed at LucasArts, what was the genesis of the idea? You know, what was ah, sure. Um, so it was so called the, Lucasfilm Games. Back Lucasfilm then. Games, which pre predates LucasArts. Um, was, LucasArts was a result of a reorg that happened a couple years after we left. Um, 
uh, the, actually, the ultimate gen- the original genesis was um, a, a discussion between uh, me and my office mate Noah Falstein um, about artificial intelligence in games, and uh, which was then a, a hot topic, and I guess it's in some senses continued to be a hot topic. Um, and I made the observation that we didn't know how to create a computerized opponent who had the kind of depth and richness of character and sort of subtlety of a real human being. But we did know how to connect you to another real human being. Maybe we should play with that. And that unpacked into a series of proposals that we had in our kind of file of interesting ideas so that when Clive Smith from Commodore came around shopping for interesting ideas that we might do collaboratively, um, one of his things was they had just invested in this online service for Commodore 64 users. And, and well, sh- lo and behold, we had this, this idea on the shelf, and that, that's what ultimately became the original yeah. proposal for what was originally called Lucasfilm's Universe, and then was called Microcosm, and then became Habitat after trademark things. One of the things to point out, it, so this is why I like to refer to James Burke. James Burke tells stories about threads where everything is connected. One of his series is called The Day the Universe Changed. I highly recommend it. Um, there was a confluence of events. This happened for one reason and one reason only, and two words, Star Wars, right? George Lucas was on the top of the universe and he had a games division. We had some visionary people who could do some amazing design, pitch stuff, and there were people who were willing to sign up for anything as long as it had George Lucas's name on it. Yes, although the Lucasfilm Games division had this strange set of constraints. Our, our marching orders from George were stay small, be the best, and don't lose any money, in that order. Um, and one of the kind of fundamental constraints we had to work with uh, well, there, there were two. One was we couldn't use any of the company's money to do anything. We had to bring out, out in outside funding for whatever it is we do, which turned out not to be that hard because everybody wanted to, to bask in the reflected glory of Star Wars, and so we could, we could make deals. We were basically in the stone soup business. Um, and the other was we weren't allowed to use any of the Lucasfilm uh, properties, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, any of those things. It was only much later that those found their ways into Lucasfilm games uh, because those were considered money in the bank. And so we had a lot of creative freedom and we were small enough and under the radar that we were allowed to get away with having a lot of creative freedom. And so lots of interesting projects happened because other companies would come to us and say, hey, we want to, we want to be close to you. We want to be buddies. And, uh, and we'd say, oh, sure, you know, give us some money and we'll do a project together. Any more questions? Because we're just about out, I think. All right, I don't see any more questions. I want to thank you very much for your attention. I hope it was entertaining. Is that okay? Thank you very much.